listening? It is I, Numator 479. According to our studies of your puny mammalian race, we discovered you like very good coffee. And while it is our evolutionary purpose to cause you psychic torment, we want you awake and vivacious to give it. So try our new blend from Spring Hill Jack Coffee, reptilian in the morning. Our proprietary blend of lightly roasted cocayo husks will have you immediately energized upon emerging from the pain cloaca with all your slippery new eggs. Thanks, honey. Hot, hot, I'm cold blooded. Ah. Mmm. Thanks to Spring Hill Jack and last podcast on the left, I'm ready to get out there and eat some babies. Get out of the way, Hillary Clinton. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. A lot of massacres in this one. It's a big massacre. Well, actually, there's there was a massacre last time, and there's a massacre this time. Mm-hmm. But it's, the funny thing is, is that less people died in the second one, and yet that's the one that's known as the massacre. I think maybe yeah, branding. <laughs> it's about where it, when it arrives. Rick Rubin, yeah, mm-hmm. talked all about the idea of that. You know, it's not about what you make in the project; it's about when you deliver it. Mm-hmm. You know, so maybe it's got a lot to do with it. Quite maybe possibly. Rick Rubin was there. I mean, I know the. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like it. Time tra- Can you does. imagine oh. Appalachian Rick Rubin? There'd be a lot more banjo, that's for sure. Yeah. Have you I thought got about na- playing the feet? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, play the feet? You're like, yeah, can't you see? Your feet are drums you don't have to pay for, Jay-Z. And then he's just like, no way. We could have had feet rap. <laughs> we could have had a whole world of board stomping samples that... Man, I wish Rick Ribbon was Appalachian. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the last podcast on the left, everybody. My name's Marcus Parks. I'm here with Henry Zabrowski yeah. and Ed Larson. Mud. It's his favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it was his first word. Yeah. Mud. Yeah, like the butt was my second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're here for part two of the Hatfields and McCoys. And we're going to get a little bit more death. A little, actually, when you compare the death in this one to the death in the last one, about equal. Got it. All right. So when we last left the Hatfields and the McCoys, a Hatfield vigilante group had just executed three McCoys by firing squad after a Hatfield had been murdered in a drunken fight that had allegedly started over a standing fiddle debt. Hey, why was the show so long? You just did it all right there. Yeah, that's it. Congrats. <laughs> that shows the power of storytelling. Yeah. Brevity. Brevity. <laughs> so, well, so let's get it straight. Now, remember, so the Hatfields, they got money and strength and numbers. And these, land. And land. And they got yeah. all the timber. McCoy's glandular issues angers, to yeah. make them super angry. Yeah, yeah, they have anger spheres yeah. deep inside of them. <laughs> remember that? So, yeah, so right now what? So, Technically, it's Hatfield's three, McCoy's zero, or no, two. One. No, it's, one. No, it's Hatfield's four, McCoy's one. Got it. Yeah, because you got you can't forget about Harmon McCoy yep. way back in the day. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Like, during the war. Yeah, right out. Yeah, during the war. Yeah, or right at the end of the war, yeah. Okay. Which is, that's te- te- technically the first shot fired. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is four to one at this moment. And how many men are named bad? Uh, two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in this in this episode, there will be two men with the modifier "bad" attached to their name, but they are very bad. They oh, are very yeah, yeah, they yeah. are very bad. Uh, one of them, however, did give himself the nickname "bad" oh, hey, uh, because he was like, "I want to be worse." <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> worse, Frank. Well, after the Pawpaw murders, the matriarch of the McCoy clan, Randall McCoy, had taken his wife's advice to let the law take care of the Hatfield vigilantes. Randall had come to call these vigilantes. Devil's Hellhounds. Cool. After the Hatfield Patriarch, Devil Ants Hatfield. Why did he make them sound cooler? Yeah, I, then I you know, cut to yeah. the Devil's Hellhounds, and you know it's just three guys sitting on the porch going like, "Feels like it's gonna rain today." <laughs> yeah. I yep. found something new on my nuts. Yep. <laughs> Is it another one of them ornery spheres? <laughs> well, well I, mean, I mean, technically, the guys in Deliverance weren't up to much until Ned Beatty and Burt Reynolds showed up. Finally, yeah. an uh, inside an incident. <laughs> <laughs> was it Burt Reynolds or was it uh, John Voight? 
Jo- what do you mean? In Deliverance. They were both in it. Yeah, okay. they were both there. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Ned Beatty had that, you know. Well, we, we'll talk about that later. Delicious yeah. sliding backside. <laughs> Burt Reynolds broke his leg and John Voight was the unlikely hero. Gotcha. Okay. And so in September of 1882, a grand jury issued indictments against 20 Hatfield supporters and Devil Ants Hatfield himself, even though Devil Ants claimed to have once again been sick in bed when the triple execution had taken place. I had the goddamn sniffle. (laughs) (coughs) I'm sorry, I can't go to the feud today. I, 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 someone bring me some chamomile. I'm thinking about y'all because I got my crud, I don't and want I don't want y'all to give y'all the crud because it zips through a few. You wouldn't believe. <laughs> it seemed, however, as if there wasn't much urgency behind those warrants, either because the sheriff of Pike County had figured that the eye for an eye principle had been applied correctly, or more likely because the Hatfields were a heavily armed and highly capable crew. Doesn't want to yeah. deal with them. No, they're scared. Yeah, I mean, these are extremely dangerous people. Yeah, there's and more Hatfields than cops, probably. And yes. you gotta go look for them. Like, it's not like they're all in one big, like, office building. It's not like you're attacking Tesla. No. Like, it's like, it is a place you have to go deep in the woods and scurry them out. It's yeah. like Vietnam. You're going out into the bush on their territory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, no Hatfields were arrested for what came to be known as the Pawpaw murders for the next five years. But while some historians claim that those five years were peaceful, they really only say that because those years were free from multiple murders and massacres. It's kind of like what we're going on, like, in America right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not directly in a war, (laughs) but it sort of feels like it. Yeah, it feels like it all the time. It's uneasy. Now, how many people is a massacre? Is three a massacre? Let me ask. Google. If I were to guess, I would say a massacre. Well, I think five massacre, was the Boston massacre. Massacres also, I think, depend on intent. I think it. It's, okay. I think it depends on a reporter. Yeah. Mass killings. <laughs> like, it's a mass killing. It says here. Um, ah, see, there's no the, legal jurisdiction because these days we use the word mass killing, the the phrase mass killing, more yeah. than we use the term massacre. Yes, yeah. because massacre is just like again. It's about branding. Well, it's also massacre is something that you attach more to like a horror movie, like Slumber Party Massacre. Yeah. You know, it doesn't oh, yeah. have quite the same weight as it once did. What Joan Rivers used to say about an like an outfit. Oh, my God. It's a massacre. It's a massacre. <laughs> <laughs> See, after the execution of the McCoy brothers, men armed themselves with knives and pistols wherever they went, even if they weren't a Hatfield or a McCoy. And as we all know, the more weapons people have, the more likely they are to use them on each other. Dude, I got this kitty clumper at the house. It's like an ebony stick with a ball on the end of it. There's like a point at the end of the ball. It's yeah. like, I got it in Africa. Mm-hmm. And they use it to like hit lions in the head as they're charging you and shit and fucking kill them. I'm fucking waiting. Yeah, it's all he's <laughs> been talking I'm about. Waiting, dude. I'm waiting, yeah. dude. I fear for the Amazon drivers on his street. Yeah. I fear. I just got for... my Christmas axe out of storage. God, oh. God help me if an Uber Eats guy <laughs> accidentally delivers him the wrong meal. Oh, dude, I've got house axes that are like hidden in strategic places oh, around the house. I'm absolutely. not telling anyone where my fucking axes are. Just know there's a lot of axes sitting around ready to be used. I, I got will let, two. I yeah. will let my <laughs> r- weapons remain anonymous. Yeah. So you don't know what's coming. My my uh, Julie tried to get rid of uh, one of my axes. And I was just like, and there was one of them's red. And I was like, well, that's the Christmas axe. That's, <laughs> that's for so Santa now, Claus. And so now I can only bring it out during the holidays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, watch <laughs> out. Don't, oh, you're looking like a tree. <laughs> Well, to make matters more stressful, the local deer population, which was used by a lot of the mountain folk for regular sustenance, that was stricken by a mysterious disease. Yeah, those deer thought that they could fuck without condoms for too long. (laughs) Yeah, deer syphilis. (laughs) Ran right through them. Reportedly, deer staggered around with swollen black tongues until they fell dead, and the corpses littered the forests in such numbers that it was compared to a biblical plague. God! It's coming for our venison. <laughs> <laughs> but what kept things simmering more than anything was Randall McCoy's unabated rage. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> it's tumors growing. God, imagine him just screaming, taking a shit. Ow! <laughs> this goddamn shit will get out my ass. Someone call the doctor. I'm making red rocks. <laughs> 
Well, besides the fact that he was down three sons after the Pawpaw murders, Randall McCoy's timber operations were failing while Devil Ants Hatfield was becoming one of the most successful men in the Tug Fork Valley. This rage was fueled by the aforementioned Von Hippolindau syndrome, which we discussed last week. And after I learned a bit more about it, I can see even more how it only exacerbated the feud. Yeah, it's hard when you get a bunch of anger berries growing inside your organs, man. <laughs> and it's not just that. I mean, basically, this is what I think I may have figured out here. Okay. Basically, the Hatfields could actually see the McCoy's anger physically manifest. And as we know, Yosemite Sam levels of anger can be very funny. <laughs> Right That's what my father used to do. <laughs> so I'd imagine some of the Hatfields might have poked the McCoy bear a few times on purpose just to get a patented McCoy reaction. Hey, yeah. Sam, watch this. I'm going to throw an apple at that moron over there. <laughs> hey there, gotcha, McCoy. And he's like, ah, shit, man, you're wasting apples. You're wasting apples. Hey. <laughs> That's so much fun. <laughs> So, as a consequence of the disorder, McCoys would reportedly get beat red in their face <laughs> as their <laughs> overloaded adrenal glands became engorged at the most insignificant <laughs> slight. What if we told you that these were light Folgers crystals? <laughs> 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 their hands would start shaking. They'd get splitting headaches. Their hearts would beat out of their chest. In some cases, their faces would like wildly twitch. In some extreme cases of VHL, a person can get so angry that they actually pass out from what one author so poetically called an overdose of wrath. That's amazing. Wow. That's fucking cool. <laughs> I, I gotta get there. <laughs> Not far. Yeah. Not that much. But that's all to say that the McCoys held grudges and were generally unpleasant to be around. And that went double for Randall McCoy. Now, after the Pawpaw murders, Devil Ants Hatfield stayed in hiding while his so-called hellhounds acted on his orders. Top amongst his men was his son Cap Hatfield, so named because he'd lost an eye after an accident with a percussion cap. Yeah, because Cyclops was already <laughs> trademarked by Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Known as one of the most merciless and just plain nasty members of the Hatfield clan, Cap would be responsible for some of the most reprehensible and inexcusable actions to come. As far as appearance went, Cap was described as a grim figure with a trimmed beard, a mustache, and bangs slicked across his forehead that made him look, in the words of author Lisa Alther, like Adolf Hitler, only gloomier. Wow. Oh. That's, that's hard to yeah. be a sadder Adolf Hitler. Because <laughs> I don't think he, it's not like when I see Adolf Hitler's face, the first thing I think of, like, that guy's got it figured out. <laughs> that guy's loving life. Imagine if he only had one eye, how much angrier he'd be. Oh, well, <laughs> or would make him more empathetic. I don't think so. Nero, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll never know. Well, it's supposedly he had one testicle. So well, we know oh, that. that yeah, did, yeah, but yeah. that didn't. That did nothing. I mean, no. That just made him angrier. Yeah. This, yes. Yeah. Well, Cap also had a bad go of it when he was 15 after being shot in the stomach on Christmas Eve. The bullet destroyed part of his colon, and for a long time, it was said that anything he ate would partially spill out of the wound. Now oh. I got a mind to show you my second butthole <laughs> if you quit talking. <laughs> He's huh? such a dick that he had two assholes. Yeah, I got two. All right, I got my, I call one asshole A, and I call this one my side piece. <laughs> Here's my little finger. Look at it. I can stick my finger out. <laughs> Ultimately, though, Cap Hatfield was a quarrelsome and vindictive young man, described as simply bad without a single redeeming point. A prime example is how Cap got his wife. And the key word is got. Yes. Yeah. He had become enamored with his first cousin, Nancy Smith, but she turned down his offers of marriage for years on end. She's got all the finest qualities of my aunt, meaning bosoms and legs, and she got all the finest qualities of my uncle, meaning the big old face. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Nancy Smith married a timber merchant, but he somehow managed to get mysteriously murdered two years after their wedding. Murder was never solved, but after that... Nancy Smith finally gave up and married Cap Hatfield. See? Romance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That used to be romance yes. when a woman just decided to make the rest of her life horrible. Yeah. <laughs> You're scary enough. <laughs> or it was decided for her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
But while Randall McCoy stewed in his juices, Devil Ants built up his timber business from various hidey holes, and Random Hatfields and McCoys murdered each other with fair regularity, but little fanfare. There was, however, another character waiting in the wings to join on the side of the McCoys, a man who had been biding his time for years. That was the son of Rich Jake Klein, Perry Klein. This was the man who'd gotten the shit into the stick years earlier when Devil Ants Hatfield had swindled him out of Klein's 6,000-acre birthright. Oh, yeah. And those tender memories go long. Yeah, and he's the only one with, like, an actual education. Yeah, he's in a, he becomes an attorney. Yeah. yeah, in the years since, he'd become an attorney, and it's been a lot of time forming political connections, which he'd use against Devil Ants Hatfield in service of both his own personal vendetta and the McCoy cause. See, once Perry Klein became reasonably successful, he cozied up to an up-and-coming Kentucky politician named Simon Bolivar Buckner. Great names in this whole fucking... I I love all of this. There are so many great names, it's hard to remember whose side what person is on. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the funny thing is that it's kind of a... It's an interesting name because Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar. Yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. Bolivia. You know, down he was a huge uh, figure in South America. They probably saw it in a magazine or something. (laughs) They're like, Bolivar! That's a (laughs) great... (laughs) <laughs> well, Buckner was running for governor of Kentucky, and Klein promised the relatively ample McCoy vote if Buckner promised to bring the Hatfields to real justice for the Pawpaw murders. And this is where the government comes in. Mm-hmm. See, at this time and place, murder was a relatively loosey-goosey charge. It's yeah. more akin to today's charge of manslaughter. This was due to the fact that Kentucky's prisons were so packed that if a murderer was not sentenced to death, he could expect a release after only... Eight years or so, on average. Like Norway. (laughs) Such extreme differences. Yeah, it really is. Well, it's because it it shows they're like, well, they're either a super villain, like they have killed dozens of people and they're a war criminal. We got to kill them right now. But if you just kill like one guy, it's like, you know, we got enough people to feed anyway. You know, we we don't need all these people. Well, how hard can you break a rock? (laughs) It would help. Uh, I think I need to go. I gotta go. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I can break some rocks. <laughs> Furthermore, the governor at the time was pardoning as many people as he could to earn votes. By the time he was out of office, he'd released over a thousand inmates. In other words, if the Hatfields were caught, convicted, and incarcerated, the punishment would most likely not fit the crime in the minds of the McCoys and Perry Klein. They want total destruction of the Hatfields. Yep. They want them to be taken down. They want their lands back. They want uh, they want them all dead. Yeah. So Perry Klein hitched his star to Simon Bolivar Buckner. And after Buckner was elected, Perry Klein was able to get the Pawpaw murder indictments brought back to the forefront five years after the murders had occurred. And when it came to feuds, Buckner was no longer all that concerned with Ranklin the locals, as feuds in general were starting to become a serious problem in Kentucky. Besides the Hatfield-McCoy feud in Pike County, there were five other feuds that were even bloodier, although none of those had the natural narrative structure of the Hatfield-McCoy feud. Yeah, that's why we can't get into it, because yeah. they're really just a bunch of guys killing each other in the woods. Yeah, that's it. And, and no just, one even knows their names. Yeah, they knew their names, but nobody remembers their names today. It yeah, was, gotcha. yeah, And they looking back, and it's also very poorly recorded. Yeah. Uh, and this it, was is just, like a, it was just a, it was a violent mess. Kentucky was a violent mess. Yeah. As we have said before, before it's it's just interesting because this this one feud just serves as a weirdly picture perfect way to look into this phenomena yeah and it's all spelled out you know that shows kind of like the dynamics between the groups mm-hmm. yeah, and they just kill someone and dress them up like a dead deer and call it a day yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've been like oh someone must have been yeah, paint his tongue black <laughs> <laughs> my god that deer was just enjoying his life dancing disco anonymous partners and then the grim reaper comes <laughs> But besides the fact that the previously entertaining feuds were becoming a real danger, the feuds, in a much more historically consequential sense, were getting in the way of the industrialization of Appalachia. Or Appalachia, Appalachia. I got enough response back that said Appalachia is fine. Cool. It's just Appalachians do that. And they're the ones that get mad when you don't. Okay. But most yeah. don't. But to people within Appalachia 
and Appalachia, it does exist. But, you know, it's you. It's on you. It's right. like the Nolans thing, you know? Oh, like, yeah. You know, yeah. They yeah, get mad. Be no matter how you say it, they get mad. Yeah, I understand Yeah, saying that. New Orleans is not correct. It's it's at least New Orleans. But you most of the time, you go, no. no. But then also Robin understands it's like Long Island. Yeah. Technically, Long Island is one word. Long Island. Yes. Yeah. yeah. While the railroad, coal, and timber industries were still rapidly expanding, the feuds were not what you'd call business-friendly. And if Buckner could get these feuds under control, then he'd be able to bring in the serious money men, people like the Rockefellers. Oh, and yeah. everyone involved could become truly wealthy. And now you guys get to all be brought into the fold. And then, just so you know, there's great opportunities for all of you guys to work yourselves to death <laughs> in our minds <laughs> while you guys used to just live here for free and sustain yourself. But you needed us yeah. Yeah. because now we give you this opportunity to die yeah, yeah. underground. So if you stop killing each other, you could die <laughs> with it slowly. With it. Slowly. <laughs> with the yeah, yeah, you could yeah. die slowly in my name. It's yeah. great. And so in 1887, Governor Buckner posted rewards for the 20 some odd Hatfields who'd been indicted five years before. This attracted loads of bounty hunters who made life even more dangerous for the people caught in the middle. Additionally, Buckner also reached the governor of West Virginia, a man named E. Willis Wilson, who was nicknamed Wendy, not only because he gave long speeches, but because he was a frequent and fragrant farty bitch. Now listen, all right? My speeches are not that long. <laughs> this is about the farts, and I know, because I am Wendy, all right? They call me Wendy because... God! <laughs> I go. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm having a hard time even getting through this speech. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Name's Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll remember it. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> well, I expected it and wanted it. Yes. <laughs> it was included for a reason. It was encouraged. It was encouraged. <laughs> but far to your know, Governor Buckner asked Governor Wilson to authorize a special deputy to hunt the indicted Hatfields. And that's how bad Frank Phillips got involved in the Hatfield-McCoy feud. Bad Frank, he was the one who gave himself the nickname. But he deserved okay. it. Yes. He's the one that deserved it. Now, did he have a Grogu? <laughs> Can you imagine the weird little Appalachian preemie that somehow continued to live? Like a little satchel next to him? <laughs> you must protect the child. <laughs> 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 but while you may imagine Bad Frank to be an old grizzled bounty hunter type, a Clint Eastwood, if you will, he was in fact just 25 years old and already had two ex-wives and five children under his belt. Yeah, and fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd argue that he hadn't earned the nickname Bad Frank yet. I Not think yet. Bad Frank is for some 35 and older. You don't get bad Frank until you hit 35. Mm. Well, mostly it's because, in my mind, if I'm calling somebody bad Frank, it's because I know a good Frank. <laughs> and I'm just labeling a bad Frank because, you know, I, you got to know that's the Frank you don't get haircuts from anymore. Yeah, but you also don't give yourself your own nickname. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, I guess you don't. Yeah. So if you start telling people, no, it's bad Frank, then there's something going on. Hey, now, hey, I'm bad Frank. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. You can't yeah. stop and correct people. No. Described as a rat terrier of a man, Bad Frank was small but fierce and was feared even by the McCoys with which he'd allied himself. It's just a scene from a movie. You could totally be like, all right, now who's going to handle our little Hatfield problem? They're like, we can get super tall, Greg. <laughs> no, no, I got to hang last week. We're going to get quite the feet to hang yeah, super tall, Greg. You had, we had, honestly, we had to put a tree on top of a tree. It was an almost Egyptian level architectural market. What about uh, cholera Jim? Also passed recently. And there's a hat going around for that for his family also, by the way. It's a bit of a, we're doing, it's called a go fuck me. Um, uh, but, um, also, uh, but you know, then the, the crowd parts, mm -hmm. and it's just this little tiny man being like, yeah, I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as what bad Frank did for fun, he drank. But he was yep. also said to accost strangers he came upon during his travels by shooting at their feet to make him dance, all while he laughed himself silly. That shit's not like a... That's is, that not, not, is that real? That's real. Yeah, yeah, People yeah, yeah. would do it. Dance! 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 Woo -woo! <laughs> Yeah, all right. You can go now. All right. <laughs> well, I've wasted all my bullets. 
Because <laughs> then the guns are empty. Yeah. And now the guy can just kick you in the nuts. <laughs> if he's got any toes left. <laughs> yeah, if he, yeah, if he won. Yeah. If he danced fast enough. Yeah. Fly from your grave. Now, Bad Frank almost immediately got overzealous when it came to his appointment as special deputy. He overstepped. The people of West Virginia soon came to fear Bad Frank as a man who would invade homes without a warrant, kidnap anyone who he thought might be involved with the Hatfields, and whisk them away to Kentucky. In one instance, Bad Frank Phillips arrested a man that he thought was a Hatfield ally named Tom Chambers. But while the guy he arrested was named Tom Chambers, it was not the right Tom Chambers. Strangely, the man Bad Frank arrested was Tom Chambers' stepfather, who was also named Tom Chambers. This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. Their story is like so annoying sometimes. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> They need you just like name each other different. <laughs> have different names. Awful Frank. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nuisance Joe. Yeah. Stinky Tom. Stinky yeah. Tom. Yeah. But even though Bad Frank quickly lost his official position as special deputy because of fuck ups like this, he continued his duties in an unofficial capacity. Due to his tenacity, he and his posse had, by Christmas Day, 1887, illegally abducted most of the indicted Hatfields for trial in Kentucky. Damn. Now, Devil Ants Hatfield was at a bit of a loss as to how to stop this without killing a government-appointed official, even if Bad Frank's title had been stripped away. Finally, though, he figured that if he took out the angriest, most rageful McCoy, the rest of the family would run out of steam. That, of course, is how Devil Ants Hatfield decided to justify a murderous raid on the home of one Randall McCoy in what came to be known as the New Year's Night Massacre of 1888. Now, I want y'all boys to remember, right, Randall's gonna be ornery, gonna be lazy, right, he's gonna be sitting in a chair, seems to be almost, like, useless in a way, unable to defend himself in many others. We're gonna get him tonight. Yeah. Now, to take down Random McCoy once and for all, Devil Ants tapped Bad Jim Vance as head of the raiding party. Yeah. Bad, Bad Jim Vance very much earned his nickname. Yeah. He was a little older. In the years since the feud began, Bad Jim also came to be known as Crazy Jim. See, this is a good, yeah. that's a promotion. Yeah. In this time and place, <laughs> Crazy Jim was a nickname to take seriously. Oh, yeah. If yeah. you're in, nobody's wearing a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> right, like you're in an area where nobody is a normal man. Normal yeah. doesn't exist. Well, that, that's going a little bit far. That's playing into the stereotypes I'm that sorry. aren't necessarily true. You're right. Yeah. You're I mean, right. there are men who don't wear shoes that squirrel hunt and Sam. That's different. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, different. yeah that's natural. But still, like these people were, I mean, by evidence, unhinged. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So for, on the whole, yeah. I'm saying they're unhinged. So if he's crazy, Jim. Yeah, crazy, Jim. It's and because it, it's not wacky, Jim. Yeah, it's yeah. like Wacky Jim and Crazy Jim are two entirely different people. I don't want, honestly, I'd rather be next to Crazy Jim than Wacky Jim. Because hey, Wacky I, Jim will get you caught. I think that if you upgrade to no, I Wacky think, Jim, I think Wacky Jim was the guy in the fucking scene in Deliverance. Yeah, that's, yeah, Wacky, yeah. that's yeah. Wacky Jim. And like, hey, he's always got some left field idea. <laughs> he's like the kind of guy who's like suspenders break and then he replaces it with two belts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything's closed to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so on the same Christmas day that Bad Frank Phillips and his posse rounded up the last of the reachable indicted Hatfields, Devil Ant sent Bad Jim Vance with a small band of raiders to kill Randall McCoy in his own home. Now, out of the 37 Hatfield family members and goons who participated in the overall feud, nine came along on this mission. The party included, amongst others, the intellectually disabled yet highly violent Cotton Top Mounts. Gotta Remember, have him. He was the so-called Wood Colt son of Devil Ants' brother. Yeah. Uh, you had Devil Ants' three eldest sons, John C. Cap and Bob, uh, a timber crew member named French Alice, oh. uh, the real Tom Chambers. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. He's there. And a son-in-law of Devil Ants' sister Matilda named Gorilla Mitchell. And that's mm -hmm. Gur, not Gore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah, just yeah. watched Captain Ron. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gur, Gore. <laughs> Told you to watch out for gorillas. Now, the raid was supposed to take place on New Year's Eve. But as the raiding party was approaching the house, someone knocked down a fence and sent it crashing down the hill. It which... was probably cotton. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah, a yeah. shitty fence, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why even have it? He tripped over a frog. <laughs> he fell down the fucking hill. <laughs> uh, this, of course, alerted the McCoys and the raid was therefore postponed until the next night. They won't see it coming tomorrow <laughs> night. 
I think I heard a dag nabbit come from the woods. Yeah. <laughs> That's definitely, well, let me use my listening ear. Yep, yeah, that is definitely the tumble of an intellectually disabled man from the woods. <laughs> I know it well because I've done it myself. <laughs> and according to legend, right before the crew approached Randall McCoy's home on the actual night of the raid, bad Jim Vance turned to the men and said, quote, May hell be my heaven. I will kill the man that goes back on me tonight if powder will burn. It's a shame for this. He could have been a poet. Yeah. No. Yeah, but I hate punctuation. But, <laughs> I guess maybe in a fashion I would be like E.E. E. Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> but if he was a poet, it would be more like, May hell be my heaven. May hell be my heaven. <laughs> I will kill the man that goes back on me tonight. Yes. Powder will burn. You will all see what I plan to do. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, there's mud on my gloves. <laughs> no, Randall McCoy was by no means alone in his cabin. With him was his wife, Sarah, his 25-year-old son, Calvin, Tolbert McCoy's young orphan son, Mel, and four daughters ranging from five to 29 years old. Just all, I just see them all sleeping in one big bed. Like yeah. it's a Looney Tunes. We're like literally on top of each other. <laughs> all the, the sleeping caps. That's all I see. I am Mel, son of Tolbert. Son of Tolbert. <laughs> <laughs> all were asleep when the raiding party were spotted by the McCoy watchdog who barked at the first sign of intruders. Bark. Bark, bark. Bark, bark. <laughs> Once the lab... all the characters. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Once the lamplight inside went on, Bad Jim Vance yelled, Come out, you McCoys! Surrender as prisoners fall. But before the McCoys even had a chance to think it over, John C. Hatfield, either nervous or drunk, probably drunk, he fired first, which caused every other member of the raiding party to open fire on the home. There's got to be fuck trigger discipline. There's got to be. be some like you yeah. have the one guy going hold, yeah, <laughs> hold, yeah, the brave heart. Yes. Yeah, no. Well, you also just got to keep your team sober. Hmm. Make sure John C doesn't get but too how fucked do you, up. How do you get him in the killing rage? Ah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Well, determined to defend what was theirs, both Randall McCoy and his son Calvin returned fire, wounding John C. Hatfield in the shoulder. Right around that time, Bad Jim Vance got the idea to set the roof of the cabin on fire, and he sent either Tom Chambers or Gorilla Mitchell to climb to the top with a torch. The sources vary. I'd okay. send Gorilla Mitchell. Probably. That's what he does. <laughs> yeah. What does Tom do? It sounds like Tom's the guy from MySpace. <laughs> like he's just, hey, I just see the guy from MySpace just hanging out. No, Gorilla Mitchell's going to clamber. That's yeah, like, his job. Yeah. Yeah. But before they could set the roof alight, Randall McCoy shot the fire starter in the hand and blew off three of his fingers down to the knuckle. Damn, his fingers belong to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's racist against other people, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And that sent him tumbling <laughs> off the roof. Others in the raiding party, however, managed to set the cabin on fire on the ground level. But since there were no hat fields on the roof anymore, Calvin McCoy climbed into the cabin's loft, which had holes cut every six feet so it could be defended in just this type of situation. Yes. Man, you know that was like an argument between the wife and that. <laughs> like, so, so, so you got to stop cutting the holes. I'm telling you, the hat fields are coming. <laughs> they're going to they're, they're gonna start burning our cabin from the bottom. And then I'm going to climb up in the holes and say, you're crazy. There <laughs> is snow on the turkey. There is a squirrel in the bathroom. <laughs> and right in the middle of the gunfight, he just looks over his wife with this shitty and grin. Yeah, I, I told, told you. you. <laughs> what I say. What I say, Sarah. See, sometimes... Husbands are correct. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> husbands are correct. <laughs> but from that vantage point, Calvin was able to hold off the raiding party from invading the house. Meanwhile, Randall's daughters, Alifair, Fanny, and Adelaide, tried putting out the fire with water and the only other liquid in the house, buttermilk. It did little to abate the blaze, but it did create the horrible stench of scorched dairy. That's the smell of war. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. Yep. Yeah, scorching that milk. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, hear scorching that milk. <laughs> now, after the girls ran out of water in the house, Alifair, the eldest, tried making her way out to the well for more water, despite being disabled from a polio infection. No, don't send quick Stephanie. <laughs> 
Sen Alifair whose legs don't work. <laughs> yeah, that's what works. Yeah, you lose her arms. But she was the oldest. Yep. So you yeah. didn't want to send the little girls out there. I guess so. Yeah. But in an action that would sway public opinion against the Hatfields, Cap Hatfield mercilessly gunned down Alifair with a bullet to the chest. Yeah, not good. Almost immediately, Alifair's mother, Sarah, rushed to help, but she was stopped by Bad Jim Vance. Bad Jim Vance clubbed her with his rifle, breaking her arm and hip. Joining in, either John C. Hatfield or Cotton Top Mounts pistol whipped Sarah so hard that the gun butt left an impression on her skull. She was 58. Yeah, it's like fucked 59, up. 59. And, but this is what, this is why they, in the end, it's not good for them. Yeah. The rest were still busy with Calvin McCoy, who was still popping out of the loft holes, firing shots to keep the raiding party from advancing further. Eventually, he hit Cotton Top in the forearm and drove the Hatfields away from the house entrance into a covered passageway. Something jumped up and bit me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like at any point, these, every character in the story has like two to four bullets in them. Yes. I mean, yes. it does no, get there. They're softer actually, bullets. That's actually a question that's asked later on. It's just like, why is everyone getting just wounded? Why are there so <laughs> few deaths and so many wounds. I think because it's hard. It's like extremely, extremely hard. I it's think a, it's extremely difficult to shoot a man. Yeah, and the bullets are different back then. They're like yeah, little, they're soft. Yeah. I don't know, man. These, they're still like this is the time when the Winchester repeating rifles started coming along. Okay. You know, when the Colt law, uh, I think lawmaker, lawgiver, I can't remember what it's called, but like you know, Colt just came out with this pistol. The pistol they say won the West. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the those guns. Are solid, yeah. Like they're real. They're not fighting with like muskets or like single shot rifles. Because you can anymore. fight with them now. Like you yeah. can shoot one of those guns now. Oh yeah, yeah. You could hold off somebody with a Winchester repeating. Yeah, it's, it's the one that you go like. Tch, 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 tch. Hopefully, okay, yeah. I, I, I can't wait because it was the first rifle that you could use without having to reload after each shot. So it changed the fucking game. And guess who had the Winchester repeating rifles? The McCoys. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the McCoys were the ones who actually had the better guns, which is why they were able to hold off a larger force. That's really interesting. The Hatfields are the ones with money. They get hey. the good guns. Well, it shows what happens when you <laughs> cut corners. Well, well, this is the funny thing is that eventually, like, Devil Ants Hatfield's like, they got these good, they got these, uh, we got to get some of them guns. And so they ordered a bunch of rifles and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. But... His wife filled out the order form, and instead of bringing in 10,000 rounds of ammunition, they brought in 1,000 rounds of ammunition. Yeah, it's not enough. Which is nowhere. That's like one gun battle. Yeah. You know, with the McCoys. So it's not that, yeah, she fucked up. Yeah, it's um, about inventory. Yeah. And, the and this is why Civ is important. It really is. It's all about <laughs> Civ. It's about RPGs. Mm -hmm. If you could actually sit and understand what's in your quiver, what do you have? In your supply area, all right, because you can't, because that's just as good as your fight's gonna be. Yeah, why didn't Devil Ants' wife have a Steam account? Way why back did? When? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, there were just too many Hatfields because someone did manage to set the roof on fire, which took away Calvin's advantage. He was forced downstairs, but still, he and Randall were able to hold off the Hatfields for the time being. Overall, the battle lasted for an hour and a half. But the climax came when Calvin made a break for the corn crib about 100 yards from the house to provide further defense and cover for Randall. At this point, though, events occurred very quickly. As Calvin ran, the Hatfields turned their fire on him, which opened them up to an attack from Randall McCoy, who busted out dressed only in his nightshirt and long johns, holding a double barrel shotgun. Well, now we've woke up daddy. <laughs> now he's ready to go. That's yeah. scary. Yeah, this is the 19th century version of the game Don't Wake Daddy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first barrel of the shotgun hit John C. Hatfield in the shoulder, although most of the damage was absorbed by his thick coat. Likewise, Gorilla Mitchell was shot in the gut by the second barrel, but his cartridge belts stopped most of the pellets. Because Randall McCoy, what it sounds like, he's just too far away for the shotgun to yeah, do damage. he's just blasting from the porch. Yeah. Out of shots, Randall then went for cover, but he hadn't kept the Hatfields busy enough for Calvin to make it to his own cover behind the corn crib. And just as he was almost there, either Johnsey or Cap Hatfield aimed and shot him in the head from 75 yards away, at night no less killing him instantly. That's like one of those things they'll talk about forever as friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you remember? Those are like the kind of guys who do all those Instagram tricks. You know, they yeah, just yeah, sit yeah, there yeah. and throw the card for fucking for, four yeah, days yeah, until yeah. they get it. We're supposed to pretend like that. You're like, wow, you got this in one go. <laughs> I mean, they've been there for an hour and a half shooting. <laughs> yeah. They're going to hit him eventually. <laughs> Randall, meanwhile, managed to slip away to a neighbor's farm where he burrowed and hid in a haystack to save himself from death by McCoy or exposure. 
With their target long gone, the Hatfield gang rode off with their wounded in tow. And just before Cotton Top Mounts passed out from the pain, he famously said, Well, we killed the boy and the girl, and I am sorry for it. We have made a bad job of it. There will be trouble over this one. Yeah. <laughs> so the only rational person's Cotton Top? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's the only one that, like, <laughs> He's the only one that like sees ahead. I like, feel like that baby, was bad. That was bad, and I feel like it's going to come back and haunt all of us. Y'all think maybe we should hire a PR firm? <laughs> hey, it'd be nice. <laughs> maybe we should talk to a lawyer. <laughs> Now, despite being clubbed and pistol whipped, Sarah McCoy, 58 at the time of the attack, she'd survive. She had, however, been knocked unconscious. And by the time she woke up on that cold night in January, the blood from her head wound had frozen her hair to the ground. Yikes. Eventually, neighbors came to help. And the story that was told showed that the Hatfields had finally gone too far, even for the feud-obsessed people of Appalachia. Particularly, people took issue with the murder of Alifair McCoy. Absolutely. And the nature of a midnight raid on a family home. That just generally left a bad taste in people's mouths as well. You kill people outside at an election. That's <laughs> yeah, how it's yeah. supposed to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, instead of being basically another spontaneous gang fight or a gun battle between a bunch of idiots, the Hatfields had engaged in a premeditated raid against a family. It wasn't just guys blowing off steam anymore. No, they'd set fire to a home without mm-hmm. regard to the children inside. They'd savagely clubbed a grandmother nearing her 60s. They'd gunned down a polio survivor survivor who was a woman to boot for no crime greater than trying to keep her family cabin from burning down. Yeah, You don't have to complete all your New Year's resolutions on the first day. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it gets through to March, all right? Shoot a girl who survived from polio in the springtime. But even though public opinion had turned against the Hatfields, Randall McCoy and his two surviving sons still had to move out of the Tug Fork Valley. Because there was nothing left for them on the farm. They moved into town in a Pikeville over in Kentucky. So right now, Hatfields have won. Yeah. That's how I'd put it. Hatfields are currently winning the feud. Yeah. They're winning the feud, but they're... They're, they're losing winning... the people, but yeah. they're winning the feud. Yes. But as far as Devil Ants Hatfield went, he was far more upset that the raiding party had failed in their mission to kill Random McCoy than he was about how badly they'd fucked up the job. Because there's partially a little bit of him that does sort of... I, I Maybe it's too much credit. Give him a little bit of practical... Like, he knew that if they killed Randall McCoy, it will end. Yeah. The feud will go if yeah. we just give we knock him out. Yeah. But, but it was but it was also But you still killed a bunch of little girls in the process. Well that's the thing. Is that it was also on him to realize that if you send a fucking band of raiders to and a if person's you, home And you if you don't I mean this is fucked up if you leave witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's they, also they, the left, they left a lot of witnesses. But though. they could have killed every. I mean, yeah. if you killed the entire family you and burned the house. The job you have to yeah. do something that's horrible. Yeah. Yes. But you also want people to know that it oh, was. Oh, they'll the know because they'll go to the McCoy house and it's gone. Yeah. It's like a burning, it's like a pile of, of cinders and everybody's dead. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because the raid had gone so badly, Bad Frank Phillips and attorney Perry Klein formed a posse of 20 men to resume the raiding of random homes in search of the Hatfields. Because Perry Klein, you would think, it's like, oh, he's the guy that's an, he's an attorney. He's, you know, involved in politics. He was fully involved. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. these people. Like, he was out there. He's angry. Yes, he's very He's motivated. Angry. Yeah. But where not a single Hatfield had been found in five years following the Pawpaw murders, it took only eight days to find and kill the leader of the New Year's Night Massacre. On January 8th, 1888, Cap Hatfield and Bad Jim Vance were walking along a mountain path carrying a bucket of gutted squirrels. Just me and my buddy going through them forests. We're going to have ourselves some squirrels. You are my best friend, Bad Jim. You are my best friend, Mr. Cap. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, bad Jim he wasn't in any mood yeah. to sing any songs because even though they had a bunch of gutted squirrels he made himself sick because he'd eaten too much raccoon meat it's just so sweet and slimy yeah. when, you, when you got a bucket of squirrels save a little room don't eat all the raccoon meat it's one of those things where oh I sit down and the first thing they serve is all these delicious <laughs> raccoon meat right and yeah. I'm starving you know, and I'm blowing through the appetizer <laughs> I don't even get to the entree I got to work on my portion control. I, I got to think about my eyes are bigger than my stomach. I didn't want to finish the raccoon, but I needed a new hat. <laughs> and so, <laughs> man, man, my hat's wet. 
<laughs> now, Cap and Bad Jim were able to see the posse led by Bad Frank Phillips and Perry Klein coming down the road, so they hid behind some rocks. When the moment was right, they started shooting. But maybe because Bad Jim was still reeling from his succulent raccoon meal, he was quite quickly shot in the arm. Knowing that it was all over for him, Bad Jim told Cap to run off and warn the other nearby Hatfields about the posse. And this posse also included Squirrel Hunting Sam and a man curiously named Shanghai Will Ferrell. Think about <laughs> this. <laughs> that there was a man named Shanghai Will Ferrell yeah. during this time period. <laughs> and we know nothing else about it. There is no, there's no history about it. We just have the single, I'm going to say, Mysterious. That's a mysterious name. Well, I think it was him. Will <laughs> Farrell's had him expunged from the internet just out of fear of getting canceled. Where <laughs> is Shanghai? Yeah. Well, you, well, he might have got Shanghai. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that was an actual term. Like, it was an actual thing that people did. I mean, it was probably a racist term. Now, what it? is it again? Uh, Shanghai is when you are, it's kind of like, it's, well, the term from what I remember, it's you get kidnapped and forced to serve on a ship. Basically, mm. I don't know what, how the, the origins of the term, but that's what it is, is that you, it's a, uh, it's with the, the, we did an underground tour many years ago of San Francisco where they talk okay. about that they would you'd go to a specific shady bar that you probably shouldn't go to. And like that bar would kind of be known as a place that would deliver free workforce to these two shipment people. Well, the reason why it was called Shanghai is because, yeah, they were kidnapping guys and they were putting them they'd on get them trips. all drunk and they'd wake up on a boat. Yeah. And yeah. the reason why it's called Shanghai is because Shanghai was the common destination of ships with abducted crews. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Sure. <laughs> the, um, now why wasn't squirrel hunting Sam hunting the squirrels? Because once again, he had he was told to take a break. Yeah. They're all like sitting down here and been like, but then honestly, I, we haven't seen a squirrel in months, squirrel hunting Frank. <laughs> all right, we haven't we haven't seen a we haven't seen a squirrel month. We haven't seen a squirrel month squirrel hunting a Sam. All right. We gotta think about this, all right? It's getting personal for you. <laughs> we need you to, especially after that incident. With the full grown man dressed as a squirt. <laughs> All right, we know it's been dead. You set up a whole feud. <laughs> Nevertheless, the gunfight continued. But after Bad Frank Phillips shot Bad Jim Vance in the chest, it was all but over. Both of them aimed their respective weapons in what was to be the final shot, but Bad Frank squeezed first, hitting Bad Jim in the head, which sent his hat flying with brains in tow. Cool! Supposedly, two McCoys shook hands over Bad Jim's corpse and dipped a corner of a handkerchief in his blood to signify a blood feud revenge. You just got coyed. <laughs> <laughs> Another source claims that Bud McCoy dipped his fingers into Bad Jim Vance's exposed brains and used them to polish his boots. Look, I'll show you what I'm about to do, boys. Yeah, all right. Ew, ew. <laughs> show yeah, I show the ultimate disrespect. <laughs> Gonna polish my boots with his brain. <laughs> man, I ruined these boots. <laughs> my wife's gonna be so, so mad. So mad, yeah, <laughs> mad at me. <laughs> he then licked his fingers clean and went on his way, leaving Cap's nearly headless corpse on the path. Now, over the next week and a half, seven more Hatfield feud participants were rounded up by Bad Frank Phillips and Perry Klein. Although now that Big Jim Vance was dead, Cap Hatfield was the top target. Why do you see in my head Perry Klein, David Hyde Pierce? Uh, I don't know. David Hyde Pierce doesn't have Devil the Ants. toughness. Yeah. Kelsey Grammer. Now, that I could see. Oh. That I could very much see. I could you very don't much see, see Tevi, Ke like, Perry Klein is David Hyde Pierce? I d no, David Hyde, because David Hyde Pierce is too fussy. Randall yeah. McCoy, the father from Frasier. Oh, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So that's you're just casting crazy. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. if you think about Who's it. Who's Daphne? <laughs> <laughs> she got shot. She was the one. She yeah. was Alifair. A squirrel hunting Sam's going to be played by the dog. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. It's like Wishbone. But all these guys get their brains shot out, which is a good new pitch for a re-up for Wishbone. <laughs> but on January 19th, 1888, my birthday, Bad Frank's posse. We're old. <laughs> I thought it was the 21st. Huh? The 21st. I know when my own fucking birthday is. <laughs> it's January 19th. He might be wrong. <laughs> Holden's birthday is the 21st. 
28th. Of, uh, 28th of December. Fuck. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Bad Frank's posse ran across a sizable Hatfield force at the banks of Grapevine Creek in West Virginia, where another drawn-out yet ultimately futile gun battle was to take place. Now, there's no definitive account of this story as everyone had their own version, but by the end of the two-hour-long gun battle, Neither side had killed or captured anyone of any consequence from the other side, although there had been several gunshot injuries. Yeah, there should have there better have been. How many of these are ricochets? Yeah, yeah, I feel like a lot of it's like them shoot themselves. It's like them literally dropping bullets on their feet is what's hurting. There was, however, a death after the gun battle that would not hurt the Hatfields at all, but would greatly damage the reputation of the McCoys. So now they got one. Yeah. See, after the Hatfields retreated, they left behind an ally named Deputy Bill Dempsey. Oh. Supposedly, Bad Frank Phillips walked up to the wounded Deputy Dempsey, who'd already surrendered, and put a shotgun to Dempsey's neck. And as Dempsey begged for mercy, Bad Frank pulled the trigger and blew Dempsey's head clean off his shoulders. Cool. But the problem for Bad Frank and the McCoys was that Dempsey was an actual lawman. Mm. So arrest warrants were issued for Bad Frank and the McCoy posse. See? This is the thing. Now you fucked up. Yeah. yeah. Now that he if he's not a Hatfield, does this count on the scoreboard? Uh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. But it's it does count against the McCoy again, helping in the feud, hurting them personally. Yeah, I mean the 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 Hatfields lose a soldier, but that's it. Yeah, it's a flag on the play. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Everyone's mad. <laughs> 15 year penalty. Well, this swayed public opinion back towards the Hatfields, or at the very least, brought the needle back to the center as far as who were the white hats and who were the black hats. Becky, I was reading the news this morning. Is it possible that all war is bad? <laughs> <laughs> Becky, I'm I'm so used to things being simple and easy to decide. <laughs> which is the difference? <laughs> Also, how is Cap still alive with this second asshole? <laughs> Again, man, it just people he got were different. Better. <laughs> yeah. He got better, or it was legend. Yeah, yeah okay. it, it might it might have been legend. Yeah, again, if you're in, if you're so much an asshole that you have two, yeah. that does sound like a folklore. <laughs> yeah, because they say that like food would spill out of it. So I don't know. Cause I don't. It doesn't. Happen. I don't know that. I don't think it happens like that. Yeah. I mean, it's more likely like oh, shits. Shits gonna spill out of uh, there. Colostomy bag nation side stories l p o t l at gmail dot com. Just poop would you shoot out of that hole every once in a while? Yeah. Thank you. You know what? I think <laughs> done and from, research done from personal experience that I'm not going to get into here. I think the food does sometimes come through partially undigested. I have to rem I'm not like quite a big corn of the cob. <laughs> spinach as well. I've been having some spinach show up in my poo poo, not not digested. Yeah. Skittles? Yeah. Would they pop out? <laughs> Only no, if you I swallow them whole. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. No, I mean like bits of like chewed food. Mm -hmm. But like they side pop stories L P O T L at gmail.com. Do you have two assholes? Please let us know what it's like. No, I can just, I, I have someone I can call like right after this. I don't want to harass someone. I don't want to <laughs> hunt them down. Live from your grave. Now, the New Year's Night Massacre and the ensuing battles turned the Hatfield-McCoy feud from something the national papers might pick up every once in a while if they needed to fill space, turned it from that into front page headlines across the country. In these stories, the Hatfields were portrayed as ruthless desperados, while the McCoys were the good guys upholding the law. Interesting. Intent only on bringing the murderous Hatfield vigilantes to justice. That's an interesting first blush. Well, remember, that's kind of what the point was, because after the pawpaw tree murders, uh, Randall McCoy wanted to form a posse and go get him, and his wife said, like, no, let the law take care of it. And that had been the McCoy's line all these years. We're going to let the law take care of it. We're going to do this legally. Yeah. The Hatfields are a bunch of psychopaths. You know, they're, yeah. you know, they're, they're evil capitalists. Yeah, they're evil yeah. capitalists. Yeah. It's so weird because they're the ones with the tempers. Yes. 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 But they are righteous in their anger. And I feel, and again, it's about small scale warfare versus large massacres. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's kind of what we're looking at. It's more they pop off easy, but they, they have a guiding line of we're not supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be allowed the courts to handle this at some point. Yeah, yeah, the New Year's massacre was like horrible. Yeah, it was no, very bad. That's why yeah, they yeah. lost. They lost the. They they. That's why they're losing. Mm -hmm. As a consequence of the tide of public opinion turning, Devalance Hatfield's creditors decided to call in all of his debts at once, which he'd been refusing to pay out of principle because he believed he was being overcharged by all of them. But once the debts were called, Devalance was forced to sell off the land he'd strong-armed from Perry Klein. And who else bought it but a coal agent working for a group of Philadelphia capitalists who paid Devalance's debts as a part of the deal. In the two years following, 
much of Devalance's land was cleared for a railroad that increased the value tenfold. Because as it turned out, that land was located not too far away from a 13-foot wide coal vein. And now this is kind of what we're leading to in this series, is this idea that this was the, the true consequential part of this story. Yeah. Was that they used all of this shit to just slide on in. Mm-hmm. And because they just think they're, because they're dealing with local problems yeah. and handling local problems. Well, this is the problem when you're dealing with somebody who has a long view, quote yeah. unquote, of history, that you're just a fucking little bump on the road yeah. on. Who bought the land? Who is this guy? Uh, the, a coal agent representing a group of Philadelphia capitalists. So like, they're from they're Yankees. Yeah, yeah. they're Yankees. He's no, a guy yeah. who probably had a suit, but he probably showed up in a straw hat. Like when I used to have super powerful agents, and they'll be like, when they used to tell take me out to lunch, and they would be like, well, Henry likes big sloppy fat boy barbecue, right? They would take me to some <laughs> big gross restaurant, and then they'd eat nothing. Yeah, like, they'd sit there and eat like a salad, and they're like. Get it, fat boy. Like, they <laughs> want to see you do it. Yeah. They want to be like, get a big rack of ribs. We know what you like, you know? And then me like, so you probably showed up dressed like a Hatfield. You know, yeah. like, straw sticking out his mouth. Being like, well, I do know what it's like out here, I reckon. <laughs> Dealing with these hard, scrabbled times. Sometimes you need to reach out. Well, I, who I would compare him to the most, a character, that, an example that I know you know, the psychopath uh, advance man for, uh, in Deadwood. Oh yes, yeah. That, that, it's that, that guy. It's that guy. Okay, like yeah. yeah that's the the a, like that agent that goes out in advance of like the very very rich people before they come in and destroy everything. Yeah, this is how we take out all these idiots. Yes, yes exactly. this is how we make it so that your stuff is our stuff. Yeah. Now that isn't to say that Devil Ants was landless or penniless. Since the coal agent had paid his debts. Devil Ant still had $7,000 from the sale of his land. And it's hard to calculate what that would be equivalent to today, but it's probably in the range of like a quarter million dollars, yep. if not more. Yep. I mean, he's still a rich man yeah. in this day and in, in, in that time and place. But that's all to say that Devil Ant still had plenty of money to buy a new homestead off an eccentric wanderer named Old Hawk Steel. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't have any use but He for was it. also 25 years old. Yeah. <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> Interestingly, though, Devil Ants now lived several thousand acres inland from the Tug Fork, meaning that both he and Random McCoy had now been forced out of the area where their families had lived for almost 100 years as a consequence of the feud. It's almost like it's good for nothing. Yes. But even though, yes, yeah. more. <laughs> What, what is, is it, it good, good for? for? The economy. <laughs> we talked about it. Say it again. <laughs> yeah. National exports. Yeah. But even though Devil Ants was far away, his new cabin was built alongside a fort with logs two feet in diameter and walls 12 feet high. Inside this windowless fortress, he had stocks of food, water, ammunition, and weapons, enough to fight off a small army. Fun. To defend the fort, Devil Ants organized a small army of his own and a system for summoning them with a code of rifle shots, whistles, Bird calls and animal cries. All right. Now, when I do three rifle shots, bang, bang, two, bang. two whistles, all right? I do my squawk, and then I make a rhino grunt. You bring me my coffee. What are we doing here? Well, so intense was Devil Ants' paranoia that he installed a drawbridge yeah. over the creek in front of his own cabin. Goals. My fucking yeah. dad's and shit, dude. I want to fucking moat so bad, dog. But just as private detectives and bounty hunters galore were drawn to the Tug Fork Valley in search of fugitives, a newspaper called the New York World sent a reporter named T.C. Crawford to see if he could find and interview Devil Ants Hatfield himself. Quite a fortification here I've got here, Devil Ants. Is it called if I call you Devil? It's <laughs> nice to see I'm back from New York and I gotta hear all about this amazing view. <laughs> <laughs> now, T.C. was a city boy through and through. And once he arrived in Pikeville, he complained that every night the town turned into, quote, an absolute orgy of unruly crowds routinely overwhelming the local sheriffs. And he's from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this man is, could go down to the, like, this is when the Bowery was, like, at its worst. Yeah, this is when there was literally, it's called Gangs of New York. It was an entire movie. <laughs> as far as where all this happened, the people of Pikeville allegedly used the courthouse to sell moonshine, yes. gamble, fight, fornicate, swear, and smoke. It's fun. Yeah, sex workers referred to as she-devils. Whoa! Who wore, quote, scandalous dresses, with not much below their knees, besides coarse wool socks and men's boots. 
But T.C. Crawford was able to find Devil Ants Hatfield through a friend of Devil's. The interview and the additional coverage would be the basis for the first book about the feud. An American Vendetta, a story of barbarism in the United States. This might be completely wrong, but wasn't this in like, didn't Sean Penn like meet with Gaddafi? Yeah. Was it one of those where he like sat down I and they like he did. talked he met about with it. El Chapo? Is that who El it was? Chapo. It was El yeah, Chapo, yeah, 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 where yeah. he sat down with somebody. Where you're like, he also went to he also went to Gaza. <laughs> He's in a black a lot of shit. Uh, Sean Penn. Is he still just saying I'm sorry for I am Sam? <laughs> he doesn't have to. It was a different time period. Uh, yeah. uh, he went to Libya after uh, Gaddafi was uh, for vacation or no, uh, no, 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 to tell all the people good job. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a war uh, tourist. He's a war yeah. guy. Yeah, he likes it. Well, this book would help create the stereotype of the uneducated, violent, deviant hillbilly. Although Devil Ants didn't do the people of Appalachia any favors when it came to his interviews. He had to keep kayfabe, man. Yeah, he did. When Crawford asked Devil Ants why there were so many shots fired in the feud, <laughs> but so few people hit or killed, Devil Ants said, quote, I'll tell you, a human varmint is the most curious and cunningest varmint bar is. And when he goes into a fight, he turns his body sideways. <laughs> there is presented for the bullet only four inches of life space. And even that, he doesn't hold up far and squire, right? He just keeps a dodging and a frisking about. And so when the bullets come, they don't find him. Direct quote. Sure, yeah, and they're, uh, they're so skinny. You know, because yeah, they're, the they're only eating squirrels. <laughs> when a man turns, he becomes completely invisible. Have you not seen Bugs Bunny versus Elmer Ford? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, because I haven't come across a single person in this story named like Fat Bill. No, yeah, no, it, this, no they, this is a time period where people they didn't eat like that. I don't know. I'm sure there was big there was big guys there. Yeah, yeah but there was they, definitely they big just guys. sat at the bar or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, when Crawford returned to New York City with what he believed was a full accounting of the feud, along with a healthy dose of yellow journalism, his stories ran for three weeks straight in two newspapers right next to dispatches from England about Jack the Ripper. Why true crime now? <laughs> <laughs> I actually did see a newspaper. There's a story about Jack the Ripper on one side and a story about the Hatfields and the McCoys right next Man, to it. Man, that what? was the time for podcasts. Golden age. Yeah. That is great newspaper reading. Yeah, yeah. that's fun yeah. as hell, yeah. But even though T.C. Crawford did make up a lot of shit, his writing was nonetheless captivating. He wrote, I've been away in Murderland for nearly 10 days. No one unless he has had the actual experience of a visit to the region made notorious by the Hatfield-McCoy feud, would believe that there is in this country such a barbarous, uncivilized, and wholly savage region. T.C. Crawford, 1888. <laughs> <laughs> and I realize I that he is, like, from New York, but it's not, it's not going to be good. Like, it doesn't go with the music. Go like, I Away and murder laughing. No, like, no one unless no he's one. had the actual experience. <laughs> it's not because that's when before New York was like New York. No, at this point, you the Brooklyn accent was like in full effect. Really? Yeah, it'd be yeah. like like I have been away in murder land for nearly like, ten days. Yeah. Wow, I did not know that. Yo, yeah, man, Brooklyn accent full effect. In I did not know that the yeah. Italians were there. <laughs> no, it's not. Some Italians had it, but also that was kind of a Dutch thing too. Mm -hmm. But just as the bad press was coming in about Appalachia in general, more men involved on the Hatfield side were getting themselves captured, including a particularly violent goon named Alex Messer. Widely considered at the time to be the man who blown off Bill McCoy's head at the pawpaw trees, as opposed to Bad Jim Vance, Alex Messer had a reputation for being one of the most dangerous men in the Tug Fork Valley, with a reputed 27 notches on the butt of his gun. I always find that the guys that you haven't heard about are actually a lot more dangerous than the men that you have. Yeah, also no nickname. No yes, nickname. Exactly, yeah, because yeah. he don't lock them. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, again, it lets you know I'm coming. If I'm Bad Frank, you know that I could do something bad to you. If I'm just Alex, you could take you by surprise. Yeah. Alex Messer's capture, however, was totally bloodless. On November 16th, 1888, two bounty hunters came across Messer at a general store off Big Ugly Creek. They struck up an amiable conversation. Even the creek is a nickname. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the creek didn't want that. The creek is just like, I'm just here. There's no reason to come at me. I'm just a burbling and a gurgling. That's all I am. Just using me for your coal and your logs. Well, making fast friends, Messer invited the two bounty hunters back to his place for a drink. 
But just as Messer was putting away his groceries, jabbering along, one of the bounty hunters cuffed him without a struggle. And that's all it took to capture one of the most dangerous men in the Hatfield-McCoy feud. I guess they call me Captured Alex Messer for a reason. (laughs) Bad groceries, Alex. (laughs) A similar trick was tried with Devil Ants, but to no success. A detective got the bright idea to dress up as a tramp to get close to the Hatfield Patriot. He wanted to do it. <laughs> like old school tramp with like the stick yeah. in the bundle. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, no, yeah. just <laughs> wandering through with my bindle. But a neighbor spotted the detective before he put on his costume and warned Devil Ants that someone was coming for him. Honestly, though, I want to see him. So I want to see how good of an actor he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently unwilling to commit all the way, the detective was captured and his tramp clothes were removed to reveal a brand new suit underneath. (laughs) And if it wasn't for these meddling Yankees, I wouldn't get so much bad press. I mean, I get where he's coming from, because, like, if you take your suit off, you got one. Where are you going to put it? Yeah, Yeah. where does it stay? Yeah, where does it stay? So, yeah, he just did. But thankfully, this, too, ended bloodlessly when Devil Lance's men simply escorted the detective home all the way back to Ohio. They took him to his front door and said, do not come back. First nice thing they've done so far. <laughs> First- <laughs> but it's also the idea of not getting into any more trouble. Yeah. Yeah, trying to de-escalate. Yeah. But the man who didn't get away was Cottontop Mounts, who was far harder to catch than one might expect. Detectives tracked Cottontop for days, then ambushed him near Mate Creek. Cottontop was able to get off a shot that wounded one detective in the leg, but he was eventually subdued. Y'all can't see me. I'm just a pine cone. (laughs) (laughs) After his capture, the detectives took Cottontop to the town of Edgar, Kentucky, where word quickly spread that one of the men involved in both of the most consequential events of the Hatfield-McCoy feud had been taken alive. Soon enough, Bud McCoy and a posse showed up and demanded that Cottontop be handed over so McCoy could, quote, kill him and cut him up in 10-inch pieces. Oddly specific. The lawmen refused, but did promise that Cottontop would be returned to Pikeville unharmed to face charges, which is supposedly what the McCoys were asking for all along. Yeah. Yes. Now, even though Cottontop was a violent individual, he was also somewhat of a tragic figure. I feel like even Cottontop is surprised he's still alive at this point. <laughs> <Wow>. Honestly, <laughs> I just want this going on. Stop living. <laughs> <laughs> See, in order for the feud to reach a conclusion, there needed to be a blood sacrifice on the Hatfield side. And since Cottontop was technically a Hatfield by blood because he was a so-called Woods Colt child of Randall's brother, he fit the bill. But it could also be that Cottontop became a sacrifice because he not only confessed to his own crimes, but implicated a lot of proper Hatfields and their henchmen in both the Pawpaw murders and the New Year's Night Massacre. So, yeah, he flipped hardcore. He flipped He's hardcore. Sammy the Bull Gravano. The, oh. He is that. Yeah. Believing that he would avoid execution by cooperating and confessing, Cottontop pled guilty to the murder of Alifair McCoy, Randall McCoy's polio-stricken daughter, even though it had been Cap Hatfield who pulled the trigger. But ultimately, someone had to pay for that death, and that someone was Cottontop. Again, and the Hatfields engineered it. And, you you know, this is called going to college. This is a part of getting made. You go, you do your time, right? You'll do a little bit in there on the Hooskow. You come back out, they're going to put you in the books. Yeah, that's not what the Hatfields said at all. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> See, it's the thing is that Cap Hatfield, was the one who had shot Alifair McCoy. Yes. Yeah. You know, and they needed to get Cat Patfield out of trouble. And somebody needed to go down for Alifair McCoy's murder. It wasn't going to end until someone went down for that. It yes. might as well be the most annoying Hatfield. Yes. Well, and the most dangerous and unpredictable. Yeah. And Cap also took great advantage of Cotton Top by promising him $500, mm. a rifle, a saddle, and a rescue from jail in exchange for confession. Don't worry about it. Just confess. You'll come out I'll of it. Listen. We'll break you out. It's almost Christmas time. <laughs> I'm going to show up dressed as Santa Claus. I'm going to explain that you have been absolved of your sins <laughs> and you'll come with me to the North Pole. That's in the legal documents <laughs> that say that's I can I can pop you if I'm Santa. <laughs> <laughs> But by the time Cottontop realized that nobody was coming to save him, he was already on his way to the gallows. I think it might be too late. Yeah. <laughs> now, on the day of the execution, Cottontop Mounts wanted to wait until his mother arrived so he could say goodbye. 
She never showed much to Cottontop's sorrow, but not because she chose not to come. In another tragedy, Mrs. Mounts died of a heart attack that morning on the road to Pikeville. Jeez. Oh, I mean, it's, it's stressful right. when your kid dies. It's yeah. time for him to go. Yeah. Did he know, you think, no, that he she didn't died? Know. No. no, they didn't find her body until days later. Right, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least there's that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sadly, not a single Hatfield showed his face at the execution. And the only people who showed up on that day who had any connection to Cotton Top were his enemies. Oh, yeah. And both of them showed up highly intoxicated and belligerent. The first was Bad Frank Phillips, who, prior to Cotton Top even showing up at the gallows, had fired his pistols into the air, shouting that he dealt with the Hatfields and he's now ready to run Pockville himself. Again, Bad, we're trying to just kind of de-escalate here. Yeah. All right, this whole thing, it's like you're trying to put a button on this. Yeah. Deputies eventually overpowered Bad ah! Frank. <laughs> so crazy. And they confiscated his guns. And he ended up missing the execution altogether because he was in an alcoholic coma while Cotton Top was being hanged. Oh, man. Same thing happened to me at Bonnaroo. Yeah, I, I it's fucking, very I, sl- I slept through Pearl Jam. <laughs> I, fucking, I still never forget myself. Likewise, a drunk Bud McCoy got aggressive and knocked a sheriff to the ground, prompting a swarm of militiamen to take him down as well. But concerning the execution itself, Kentucky had banned public hangings eight years before. But to technically uphold the law, a fence was built around the gallows. But the gallows had been built near a hill where the hangings could easily be watched by the 7,000 people who showed up. And there's just legal guys standing there being like, yep. (laughs) <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> exactly. So right, the, everybody, <laughs> shut your eyes. Everybody, <laughs> just close your eyes. We ain't doing this. Well, true to form when it came to public executions, women sold baked goods, men drank moonshine, and a good time was had by most involved. Yeah, everybody but one. Yeah. <laughs> everybody but one guy. Everybody but Cotton Top was having a good time. Yep. But as the black hood was being pulled over Cotton Top's head, he finally realized that he'd been had, that nobody was coming. And his last words were that the Hatfields had made him do it. Days later, a McCoy supporter delivered a package to Devil Ants' house that contained the rope that had been used to hang Cotton Top. Well, thank you. <laughs> I needed a good rope. That's amazing. It's obviously strong. It killed my kid. This is incredible <laughs> true crime memorabilia. <laughs> but after the trap was pulled and Cotton Top was hanged, there was then the matter of what to do with the body. The Mount family couldn't afford to bring it back to West Virginia, and the Hatfields were distancing themselves as much as they could from the whole affair. So, Cotton Top Mounts was buried in the Pikeville graveyard in sight of the gallows, which soon became a local hangout where drunken hillbillies held card games and engaged in the occasional fist fight. That's fun. Yeah, it's like Jim Morrison's grave. Yeah, man. <laughs> Except it's French people hitting each other with baguettes. <laughs> I went to Jim Morrison's grave. They've got these weird barriers around it, and it's really trashy because the barriers are, are covered with, like, you know, decals of people's shitty bands. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. They use it as a promo spot. Yeah. Now, even though Devil Ants, Cap, and John C. Hatfield were still technically wanted for the Pawpaw murders and the New Year's Night Massacre, the people of the Tug Valley figured good enough after Cotton Top was executed. The government followed suit in wanting to move on, although they had their own motivations for doing so. Yes. See, the next year, a man named Aratris Fleming was elected governor of West Virginia. As it happened, Fleming was connected to Standard Oil, owned by who else? But John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller. <laughs> finally makes his fucking face. Yeah, we yep. finally... We're, welcome to the last podcast. We haven't gotten to John D. Rockefeller yet. Yeah. And now he's in the lexicon. The end of the feud, you see, made the Tug Valley far more attractive to investors. And so Kentucky and West Virginia agreed that the remaining indictments for both the Hatfields and the McCoys would stay unenforced just so long as none of these guys restarted the feud. Now you're done. You're <laughs> done and that's it. <laughs> All right? You need this call. It's done. All right. You don't got to (laughs) yell. Fine. Fine. As a consequence, the Cumberland Mountain region was soon carved up by corporations who turned the formerly bountiful wilderness into a wasteland of railroads and coal mines. America! Oh, America! (laughs) See, since the media had already inadvertently laid the groundwork for portraying the people of Appalachia as barbarians, Americans generally applauded the invasion. Yay! Get the landscape! Yay! 
Yeah, blow up the river. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever tried to blow up a river? No. <laughs> Let's do it. It's surprisingly flammable in West Virginia. Yay, <laughs> cool. The river's fire now. Local politicians also welcome the corporations because their pockets were being heavily lined at the same time that their constituents were slowly being turned into wage slaves. Wage slaves. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> there was, however, a moment when it seemed like the ceasefire had been all for naught. Mm -hmm. Two years after the execution of Cotton Top Mounts, an enemy of the Hatfields named Dave Stratton was found unconscious near his house with a badly battered head and a chest that had been nearly caved in. Wait, before we jump to conclusions, maybe he did it himself. <laughs> this is some form of the worst suicide I've ever seen. <laughs> and he died a couple days later, and almost immediately, people assumed that the Hatfields had been responsible, and the officials issued warrants for the arrests of Devilance, Johnsey, and Cap Hatfield. Yeah, and you're like, God damn, it's like, finally, a person I didn't kill. It's just yep. like a Upon closer inspection, it was found that Dave Stratton had simply got drunk, run over by a damned old train. <laughs> <laughs> you know what honestly really should have teed us off was that his head was on the tracks. <laughs> it was hard he did miss to get missed by a train if we're on there. I don't know if he got run over by the train, but he definitely got hit he by got the clipped. train. Yeah, yeah, he got clipped real hard. Yeah. yeah. Not too long after that, though, another McCoy turned up dead when the body of Bud McCoy was found with 18 gunshot wounds near a lumber yard. Again, before we jump to conclusions, <laughs> what if a train <laughs> shot him? <laughs> <laughs> Dumb Steve, you get the hell out of here. Bad investigator Fred, you're in. Again, everyone was quick to blame the Hatfields, but Bud had actually been killed by another McCoy, Pleasant McCoy. His name is Pleasant. Yeah. Pleasant McCoy shot yeah. him. Over a personal grudge. I just, uh... Pleasant, if you'll remember, was the man who'd sued Randall McCoy years before because Randall had spread a rumor that Pleasant had fucked a cow. Hey! And considering how nicknames associated with events tended to stick in that area of the country, Bub McCoy's murder might well have had something to do with that. You call me cow fucker McCoy one more time? <laughs> name's Pleasant, motherfucker! It's Pleasant, you fucking bitch! <laughs> But no matter how much people wanted the feud to reignite, Cap Hatfield wrote a letter to the editor of the Wayne County News announcing that an amnesty had been declared and the so-called war spirit within himself had abated. I looked in the mirror and I declaimed myself innocent. <laughs> <laughs> the feud was finally over, with the final score being seven Hatfields and 10 McCoys. Whoa. Wow. wow. Yeah. But you said it might have been 24. I said between 12 and 25. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. 17's right in the middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> as far as what the survivors did with the rest of their lives. Oh, so now we're at the end of Animal House. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the end of Animal House, right? So the feud is quote unquote over. Yeah. So now it's all yeah. like, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Squirrel Hunt and Sam lived? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Squirrel Hunt and Sam survived. A lot of them, more of them lived than didn't. Squirrel Hunt and Sam, I'll get into him, but he lived a long life. Hey, man, it's easy going out yeah, there. Yeah. Living a squirrel's life seems Surprisingly nice. nutritious. Yeah. Well, Randall ran a ferry boat until he died, but made sure to complain bitterly about the Hatfields to any and all passengers who had no choice but to use his services. Can't wait to go on vacation with old Randall McCoy. Yeah. <laughs> I dare you to talk about the Hatfields. We're on the ferry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you another story. Uh, you're all trying to, you're on the Lido deck. Trying to <laughs> <laughs> um, ten. Ten. Nine. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> He's like running the omelet station. <laughs> so annoying was Randall McCoy that neighbors said it was a shame that he hadn't been killed in the feud. You know, and sometimes, honestly, I wish I was too. Mm -hmm. Finally, though. Randall met his end in the year 1914 when a cooking stove caught his clothes on fire during a visit to his grandson's house. Oh, man, that was a fucking Hatfield. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a Working on the stove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never knew. Yeah, yeah, he was alive. <laughs> Got you. Yeah. Surprise! <laughs> Holy shit, the stove's a Hatfield. <laughs> and Randall died two months later of his injuries at the age of 88. Wow. Concerning squirrel hunting Sam, yep. he wandered the country. He went to Nevada, California, but always made his way back to the Tug Fork Valley. Yep. He married four times. Can't fucking settle down with and the guy of the forest. Two of them women. <laughs> <laughs> and wrote a book about 
the other two squirrels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and he wrote a book about the feud in the 1930s. Surprisingly, he put a lot of the blame on the McCoys for antagonizing the Hatfields. Very interesting, but it was also a lot about acorns. <laughs> <laughs> he met his end, however, in 1940. See, Sam never wore shoes. And after a particularly cold day traipsing the wilderness, Sam's feet froze and had to be amputated. <laughs> Soon after, he died from complications related to the surgery. It's real hard to hunt squirrels on stumps. <laughs> it's real difficult but hey, to man, do it from a chair. <laughs> can you blame him? He spent 60 years hunting squirrels barefoot. Never thought about it, I guess. Man, man. at some point, the circulation stops. It yeah, does. It does. It does. As far as the Hatfields went, John C. was eventually captured and sentenced to life in prison. But six years into the sentence, he saved the prison warden's life by cutting an inmate's throat with a pen knife. Yeah, good behavior. <laughs> Extra good behavior. <laughs> for this, he was granted parole and went on to work as a land agent for a coal company owned by John D. Rockefeller. Hey, hits keep on coming. Cap Hatfield, meanwhile, died an unceremonious death from either a brain tumor or a long-held bullet fragment that eventually pushed its way into his brain. Either way, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Concerning Devil Ants Hatfield, however, arguably the prime mover of the feud, he never went into town without a pistol or rifle in his hand ever again. Oh, yeah. And stood with his back to a tree or a wall while constantly scanning his surroundings whenever he talked to anyone. No, he must not. Honestly, you know, it's traumatizing for himself. Well, not only that, but I mean, after even after Cotton Top Mounts was uh, executed, like bounty hunters would show up at his place and would just start taking pot shots at the fortress to see what like shook out. Yeah. There was even one time where a dude, a bounty hunter infiltrated the Hatfield Fortress Worked as a handyman there for six months, waited for his moment when him, Devil Ants, and this little boy the Devil Ants had taken under his wing were out hunting raccoons. The little boy shot a raccoon. Devil Ants grabbed it and was like, hey, good job. Look at what he did. And he turned around and the fucking dude's got a rifle pointed at him. And he says, drop the fucking raccoon. It's like, that's my raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> and so Devil Ants like dropped the raccoon, brought his hands to his sides, and then like in a fucking flash just... Yeah, quick draw. Him. Quick draw him and just shot him in the fucking head. Yeah, yeah. Like, yes. Drop the dude. He, him, and the four year old buried the body where it fucking lay, <laughs> and they never talked about it again. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now I'm gonna tell you a little thing about Cole hiding the body. <laughs> All right, it's important apprenticeship that you learn something like this. Now we don't have any access to lime here, now, but not normally you would smash the teeth. Cut off the hand. <laughs> Cut off the feet. Uh -huh. And you got to boil down the meat. Feet to the dog. Okay. Feet to the dog. It's fun to do. You put it in the song. It's easy to learn. <laughs> I do it for you. <laughs> wow. But that's why he was paranoid. Yes. Because, you know, yep. he, people were still. Now, was he still to... wanted? Uh, no. That he, was, he wasn't even desired. After... <laughs> <laughs> well, after Cotton Top Mounts was executed, the warrants were still in effect for a little while. Yeah. It was a bit before. Where they finally made kind of the truce of like, all right, if you guys keep your noses clean, we're not coming after you. And it's in that period of time that, you know, the bounty was still out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was technically still wanted until he died. One more question. How legal is it to kill a bounty hunter? I uh, actually, well, is that like a illegal. fair fight? That's why they buried him in the fucking woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Illegal. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it depends, because you could be working for the U.S. government. Yeah. Yeah, he might be under contract. Eventually, though, Devil Ants found the Lord Jesus Christ in 1911 at the age of 72. He was said to have been baptized with a pistol in his pocket. <laughs> and, That's cool. Yeah. And he sent an offer of $10,000 to the McCoys to withdraw the old murder indictments, some of which were almost 30 years old at this point. Incredibly, though, the McCoys refused this large sum of money but assured Devil Ants that they no longer sought revenge. They just want anything from him. Yeah. Yeah. No, they would have... They would have... Drove him crazy yeah. if yeah. they took that money. Oh, yeah. Ten years later, Devil Ant suffered a stroke and died at the age of 81. That's pretty old. These guys all made it a long time. Like, they, he, he won? Uh, no, I mean, like, uh, well, I mean, technically, uh, Randall McCoy had seven years on him. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Rand won. Randall they, McCoy was 88. It was, uh, I'd say it's as close to a draw as you can get. Yeah. yeah. Except for the entire region, That's, which absolutely lost. I'd yeah. still rather have a stroke than be killed by a living stove. Yes, <laughs> I would definitely much rather die in my sleep of a stroke than be consumed in flames. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, spend two months Yeah, going, oh, wow, wow. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, concerning the legacy of the feud, nothing in American history did more to cement the reputation of the people of Appalachia as violent, backwards, illiterate hillbillies. And I think that what we have done in this series is destroy that stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we have finally shown that the people of Appalachia are fine. Yeah. Besides T.C. Crawford's book, 92 movies about feuding hillbillies were produced during the silent film era, not to mention all the Looney Tunes portrayals. Yeah. As such, Appalachia's reputation has never really recovered, and the stereotype was given an extra layer of deviancy with the infamous squeal like a pig scene in 1972's Deliverance. And I tell you what it wasn't helped by was the show that Ed brought to my, uh, he brought to my attention. Buck Wild. It's a show called Buck Wild. Woof. Which it's, was in, in Appalachia. It's it was an MTV. Jersey Shore of West Virginia. Jesus. It went a season and a half until one of the main stars uh, died mud. Yeah, oh. died literally of carbon. His car sunk in mud and he died. Him and his of, uncle and some other guy. Oh my God. Here, here's a little clip. Yeah, they're spanking each other. Shane they're jumping in the rivers. You know why I come again to candy? Because it's trick or treat Shane. all year round. I'm yep. a really chill girl, but I've been known to get into a fight or two. She went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> they call me Justin Bieber. I don't know about the Justin, but you know I know about the Bieber. I think Joey got out clean. Yeah, yeah I, I think got out clean. Well, you know, he knows about the Bieber. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that kept him focused. <laughs> But even though the stereotype of the deviant hillbilly <laughs> lives on, the feud between the Hatfields and McCoys has long been squashed. Starting in the year 2000, descendants of the Hatfields and the McCoys began having joint family reunions, where they adorably engage in an annual tug of war across the tug fork. I think that's beautiful. It is. It's, it's very cute. Nice. It's funny. It's, it's nice. Good. But in 2003, three years after the union started, an official truce was declared by descendant Rio Hatfield, who stated that the two families have put aside their differences for good in honor of 9-11. So anybody who doesn't say that 9-11 wasn't good for anything, <laughs> don't say that it really helped so that the Hatfields and McCoys, McCoys could get together and as a unit attack Arabian people. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Hatfields and McCoys. Thank you so much. Yeah. I was wondering how 9-11 was going to get involved. Woo! It yeah, always yeah. does. Yeah, how these fucking dickheads managed to make 9-11 about them. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case y'all forgot. Yeah. You know, everybody's too busy remembering 9-11. <laughs> we were first. Fucking all over the goddamn country. We were now, the first 9-11. Now, how can I make 9-11 about me? How can I make something think. that happened in New York City about me? What me think? <laughs> I know. Well, with Virginia, there was an attack in Virginia. Yes, of course. You know, so yeah. there's, you know, they, there was a little bit close, close to home, so you know, a little bit, but, but it was an still attack stupid. on the Pen it was attack on the Pentagon. It is weird how like every person in the that hates New York like has like a Twin Towers painting in their house. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, I, I fucking remember that when I when I worked at the Onion, there was a headline that was that said very much the same thing as that. It's like you know, like Toby Keith coming out with all these fucking stick a boot in your ass. And it's like when he wouldn't pay on New York if it was on fire. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, yeah. fuck every single one of them. Well, what a wonderful tale. What a wonderful tale. It's a really mm -hmm. important American history. Um, Next week, we're getting into a super fun story for Christmas. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this I this next little series that we're doing is, it's it's a really fun, t uh, I love this topic. Um, And it's going to get real cold. Let's call this uh, a winter wonderland yeah, episode. Yeah, it's going to get real cold. And you're not gonna be happy with it no yeah i can't wait i'm excited i really really can't wait um first things first we are experimenting with new logos yes so okay. we are putting out so we're going to be doing like we're we, you know there are a lot of changes here which you guys are fucking obviously aware of and so we're going to be sort of like playing around with with how we kind of portray ourselves yeah gonna see what sticks yeah so just so you know that that's what you're gonna be seeing can we get like a snake fighting a hawk <laughs> I, honestly, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. You Idea can send number something. 34. Put, yeah, it, put it on the list. Yeah. Um, so we thank you guys for obviously, you know, supporting us and being there and listening to all the bullshit. Come out, see Eddie and I. December 22nd, we're going to be at the Knitting Factory, North Hollywood. We're going to be doing Classy Night Out. It's a Christmas spectacular. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. We got all the people from LPN that are in town are going to be there. Yes. It's going to be so much. It's basically a reason for us to all hang out. That's basically what we're doing. We can't wait. Um, yeah. 
And also, tonight and tomorrow, if you're in Florida, I'm all over the place. I'm in West Palm opening for Jeff Ross, and I'm in Boca Raton doing my own thing. Yes. Well, not my own thing, with Brian Kiley. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So Boca Raton at 8 p.m., West Palm at 7 and 9.45. I'm a fucking lunatic. Yes. I'm going to be driving all over South Florida. And then I'm going to the Dolphins game on Monday. That's Fuck yeah. You. Yeah, so fucking, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yeah, you're gonna, you deserve it, and it's going to be fun as hell. I am. And, and don't get into a fight. Oh, I never... Never way with me. Don't you get into a fight. <laughs> if I see a McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, uh, check out the Christmas Pudtacular. We're mm-hmm. doing it. We're putting the family back in Christmas. Jackie and I are doing our Good Pud Christmas special, December 14th. You're going to be amazed. You're going to learn lessons. We're all going to be share in the warmth of the holiday eating savory pudding. Thursday you guys are night. all going to like it. Yeah, yeah Thursday, Thursday night, night on 5 LPN TV. Yeah, it, Twitch. On, on twitch.tv slash LPN TV, 5 p.m. PST. You guys are all going to get to experience some of the Christmas joy, and I can't wait for you guys to, to be there real... for it. Eddie, Marcus, you're going to be there. For I'd love to. I mean, what kind of pudding am I going to get to try? You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see. <laughs> well, I mean, Christmas for me equals ham. Mm. Um, I don't know. So that that is, that is one thing that I love, but also sugar cookies. Who knows? So that's also ve- that's also very yeah. good. Who knows what's going to come out because it's a little secret. Ooh-wee. Very nice. <laughs> Hell, Gene. Hail Sid. Hail me. Hail oh, Ed. You can steal that from me? Wow. Yeah, that's yeah, mine. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's okay. me. Yeah. Guess what? I'm me. Guess what? I'm You're not me. me. Two to one. I'm giving it to him. Yeah! What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, fuck you. You're not me. No, that's mine. That's my branding. <laughs> did you say, what did you say just now? Did I you say Hail Satan, but I yeah, did yeah, say Hail Me at the end. Hail me. I said Hail Me at the <laughs> end. Yeah, you didn't say it. Hail. I say Hail Me. Hail Me. I'm Hail Me. I say Hail Me. I'm Hail Me. I'm me. Hail Me. You're Henry. I'm, I'm me. me. No, Hail Me. <laughs> hail Ham. We're working it up. <laughs> <laughs> This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors, you can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com. Yeah!